As Julie uh, suggested, I'm going to tell you tonight about some of the uh, explorations of the deep sea that I've been able to conduct in my career, and I feel super lucky to have had the career that I've had for so long. And I just want to also say to the students out there that you can absolutely have a job that you love, that you're passionate about every day. And I feel really lucky. I, I feel like I play in my sandbox every day and that somebody pays me to do that and then also educate students. So it's really a, a special opportunity. Um, so I thought I'd tell you the title is The Universe Below, Explorations of Life in the Deep Sea. And I started with a quote by Isaac Newton that says, what we know is a drop and what we don't know is an ocean. And of course, this can be true in any subject, but with the oceans, it's really true. Uh, what we don't know is so much. So I uh, mentioned in the summary for this talk that I feel like humans have usually looked up and said, what is the life like out there? And uh, not as many people look down and think about what is the life down there. And that may not be true for your, you guys, because you're here uh, listening to this talk, but I think in general that's true. And so as a consequence, we actually know far less about the surfaces of Earth than we know about the surfaces of the Moon and Mars. And the reason for that is exactly what you see in this picture, that we have, we live on an aqueous planet where most of the planet is covered by deep ocean water. So 70% um, of the Earth is covered by deep ocean. And by deep, I, you know, that ranges uh, anywhere from a few meters to 11 kilometers. But on average, the average depth is around 3,800 meters. And so that's about two and a half miles. So it's obviously very hard to get there. And um, it's fascinating, though, that every time I've ever been deep diving, whether it's a submersible, man submersible or robotic, uh, we've discovered something new to science that has never uh, been seen before. And that's some of the animals that I'll be telling you about today. So of course, I have to thank a, a pioneer. This is William Beebe. He was a naturalist at the New York Society. And he was uh, first interested in birds. And then he changed careers and decided that he wanted to do some deep diving. And so in the 1930s, he actually crawled into this thing called the bathysphere, this 5,000 pound steel ball, essentially, with another man, actually. So they were both very tall. And so they crawled in there. And they sank to the seafloor off of Bermuda to about a half a mile down. And I highly recommend his book. I brought it here. I brought several things for show and tell uh, if you want to come up afterwards. But one of his books is called Half a Mile Down, and I highly recommend it. He is the most beautiful writer about his experiences. <clears throat> and so that's, um, and they actually astonishingly lowered him by hand, really, uh, over the side of the, the boat. And so he did that in 1930 um, with an engineering friend, Otis Barton. And so we have him to thank for uh, being the first real pioneer for ocean exploration. He reported on all the amazing sea life that he saw during those dives. So the only thing connecting them to the surface was a steel cable, and it had a telephone line and the electricity. And he reported by telephone what he was seeing, and then there was an artist on the surface that was drawing the images. So um, I'm going to actually show you guys a video that I produced with some um, film study students at Occidental. <clears throat> and you will be the first audience I've ever shown this to. So I hope it goes OK. It is, um, it is some of the quotes by William Beebe. <clears throat> and, um, and a lot of footage from deep diving from myself and colleagues in manned submersibles and what we've seen on the seafloor. And so uh, it's seven and a half minutes long. So let's see, let's see if you like it. And it's, the reason why I am going to show this to you is it's called Indefinable Blue. And it is basically um, some of the quotes from uh, Dr. Beebe and his accounts, because I feel like he captured the spirit and the feeling, the amazing feeling of being in a submersible lowered down into this totally alien world. Um, and so he captured it better than anybody. There are hundreds of thousands of miles of an indefinable color of blue, absent from human language, stretching over so much of the world. The deep sea is Earth's largest habitat. 
bound by extremes of temperature, pressure, and darkness. It is an alien world, largely unexplored, and current estimates suggest that up to 10 million species are yet to be discovered. Until recently, complete darkness, frigid water, and extremely high pressures made deep sea exploration nearly impossible. Today, advances in manned submersibles and remotely operated vehicles have made the deep sea more accessible. In the late 1920s, William Beebe, a naturalist from Columbia University, and Otis Barton, an engineer at Harvard University, invented the bathysphere, the first ever deep sea exploration vessel. Beebe and Barton made the first manned descent on June 6, 1930, to a depth of 800 feet and eventually dove again to a record depth of 3,000 feet in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Bermuda. The bathysphere was nearly five feet in diameter, had steel walls, and weighed close to 5,000 pounds. Forty years later, the Alvin was built by the U.S. Navy, and since then has made more than 4,400 dives. As the first person to ever reach the deep sea, Beebe peered out of a porthole and reported his observations by telephone. We were lowered gently, but we struck the surface with a splash that would have crushed a rowboat like an eggshell. Yet within we hardly noticed the impact until a froth of foam and bubbles surged up over the glass and our chamber was dimmed to a pleasant green. With this passed our last visible link with the upper world. From now on we had to depend on gauges for knowledge of our depth speed, the weather, or anything having to do with the world of air on the surface of the Earth. The first plunge erases to the eye all the comforting warm rays of the spectrum. The red and the orange are as if they had never been, and soon the yellow is swallowed up in the green. We cherish all these on the surface of the Earth, and when they are winnowed out at 100 feet or more, although they are only one-sixth of the visible spectrum, yet in our mind, all the rest belongs to chill and night. At 1,000 feet, the last hint of blue tapers into a nameless gray, and this finally into black. The sun is defeated, and color is gone forever until a human at last penetrates and flashes a yellow electric ray of light into what has been jet black for millions of years. Beebe's bathysphere had windows made of thick, fused quartz. The Alvin has windows made of acrylic plastic, each almost four inches thick. Alvin's cockpit is a sphere, about seven feet in diameter, with titanium walls two inches thick, weighing 35,000 pounds. Both Beebe's bathysphere and the Alvin had a two-foot circular hatch at the top, with air released from two tanks, and chemicals used to absorb moisture and carbon dioxide. Both were also equipped with communication to the surface via telephone. The Alvin has two robotic arms that can manipulate instruments, and its basket can carry up to 1,500 pounds of tools and seafloor samples. Uh, so this is one of uh, something we use to control the, uh, the manipulators, the robotic arms on the outside. Yeah. And this is how we pick things up. So you twist it around and... It's supposed to almost exactly mimic the arm. Cloudy here. Yeah. which stands out clearly. With my forehead pressed close to the cold glass, that transparent bit of old earth which so sturdily held back nine tons of water from my face, there came to me at that instant a tremendous wave of emotion, a real appreciation of two human beings sealed tight in our lonely sphere, peering into the abyssal darkness as we dangled in midwater, isolated as a lost planet in outermost space.
for most of human history, we have largely looked up to the stars. Now we must turn our attention to the unexplored world here on Earth. Many potentially groundbreaking discoveries no doubt lie beneath what covers 75% of our planet, beneath what is unimaginably cold and cloaked in darkness. On many occasions, I saw indefinite large bodies moving about in the distance. On the way down, I had accredited them to an overexcited imagination, but after having the experience repeated on several deep dives, I am sure they were shadowy shapes of large and very real living creatures. What they were, I can only guess, and live in hopes of seeing them closer on some future descent. When we come to a moment or place of tremendous interest, it often happens that we realize the full significance only after it is all over. Great. Okay, so that's uh, essentially what it is like uh, in the Alvin, uh, which is a man submersible that I've been in several times, and I'd be happy to talk to people about that uh, afterwards. So with his pioneering exploration of the deep sea and then subsequently some of uh, the rest of us who came much later than him, we realized that uh, animals actually do live in the deep sea. It's unlike what was originally thought of the deep sea, which was this barren existence and that no life could possibly live there because of these extreme conditions. And one of them, the most obvious, is that it's very high hydrostatic pressure for these animals and microbes as well. And um, so the average pressure on these animals is equivalent to two elephants standing on every single inch of your body. And then on top of that, crawl into a refrigerator and then lower the temperature a little bit more. And that's actually the experience that these deep sea animals have. So it is quite extreme. And to illustrate that, I actually have a couple of heads down here. And the one, here I'll just, so this one is obviously at atmospheric pressure and the other one has gone down to uh, only 600 meters. And so you can see that that's how much uh, compression is on an object at that pressure. And they're living much deeper than that. So there's all of this hydrostatic pressure. And there's also low temperatures. It is quite cold in the deep sea. Most of the deep sea is cold. And then there's no sunlight on top of that. So there's no photosynthesis and there's no organic carbon uh, that can be generated by light uh, at these depths, and so everything that they get is either sort of rain down on them, and everybody lower lower depths gets whatever anyone else didn't eat, or they have to invent a new strategy, which is uh, something that I'll be telling you about. So some of the crazy creatures that we see there, I've brought uh, with me here tonight, but I just wanted to show you some additional photos. So this is one that I know that Mike, the director of the aquarium, likes. So this is a uh, translucent amphipod that's uh, in the midwater. Some of these animals have never been described, like this one. We call this one the Buddha isopod, so it had not been described ever. And then this one, I was an author on a paper on a weird, this is a super weird polychaete, as, uh, if anyone knows the genus Chytopterus. Um, and it also, we named it uh, scientifically after resembling the rear end of a pig. And so that is its actual Latin name. but. Uh, We'll, we can talk about that later. Uh, so anyway, deep sea biodiversity. So there's amazing animals in the deep sea, despite these challenging conditions. And currently we have about 10,000 known deep sea species. But the caveat to that is that where there are an equal number 
of specimens that we've collected that have never been described by scientists. So there's so many to describe that they just reside in museums and they don't actually have formal names. And so uh, there's probably at least 20,000 deep sea species <coughs> that have been collected. Another caveat is that um, we've explored very little of the ocean, uh, deep sea especially, and some estimates by the Census of Marine Life is that there could be up to 10 million species that we don't even know about yet. And I'll just be showing you uh, three of those that we've discovered in the last 10 years. And so it's really an overwhelming number of animals. And so for all you students in the room, seriously, uh, get busy uh, on your studies so you can get down into the deep sea as well. So if you're gonna go study the deep sea, you have to use a variety of technological advances that thankfully are far beyond the bathysphere. And um, so some of these, the top left is an AUV, so an autonomous um, underwater vehicle. And then there are some robotic submersibles that I've been involved in using. So this is the Jason, uh, owned and operated by Woods Hole, uh, middle left. Top right is a, a, a Japanese robot that it was the deepest diving unmanned submersible for a long time until it was lost at sea, but it could go into the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And so we were, uh, we were on a cruise with that. And, and then you could go Sylvia Earle style, which I'd never have done, but it would be so cool, in her gym suit there. And then finally, the, the manned submersible Alvin, and also um, owned and operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And then a variety of motherships that run those vehicles. And so you can, uh, you, scientists who study the deep sea have a number of choices um, to how to um, get down there. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to show this picture, but that's, uh, that was 20 years ago, it was my very first ever Alvin dive, and I, I feel so lucky again to have had this opportunity. Um, and it was off of the coast of Northern California, and it was in July of 1994, and we went to a depth of 3,200 3, meters. And I just checked the logs the other day, and we were uh, submerged for eight hours and 16 minutes. And um, since then, I've um, been in the oven several other times, uh, mostly on cruises by other scientists that are the chief scientists going to um, remote locations. So I'll tell you a little bit about where we go and why we go there. So um, as I mentioned, very little of the ocean has been explored, and we love to go to the deep sea floor. So very little of the midwater has been explored, even less, actually. And only about 5% of the ocean floor has been explored. And we love to look at these ocean ridges. So uh, all the areas that you see there in red are very interesting to scientists that like to look for interesting life forms, because that's where the Earth's a new ocean is being created, new ocean crust is being created, the Earth's plates are spreading, splitting apart, and there's hot water coming from the center of those um, areas, those, those uh, spreading areas, and there's underwater volcanoes, and that actually creates a very unique environment for um, animal life. Also, we love to look at subduction zones. So then some of the areas where you see in light blue along continents, we go there as well because it's also very tectonically active. So you get these earth plates are subducting one under the other and you get very unusual environments there. And so if you're looking for sort of these alien life forms on the deep sea, this is where you, uh, this is where you go. So um, you got a little bit of a taste of that from the video, how amazing the sea floor can actually look when you get down there. And uh, these, these structures that are formed at these underwater volcanoes are truly spectacular. They are, actually look like chimneys, so it looks like there's venting uh, smoke, but it's not smoke, it's uh, minerals. And you see that, um, so there's a lot of habitat heterogeneity that nobody really thought uh, did exist in the sea on the seafloor until um, probably the late 1970s. People had discovered these, they're called hydrothermal vents. And so you can see a lot of very interesting features. They almost, some of them look man-made. They're quite amazing. They're all lava, usually, these features. And you see a, a little glimpse of some of the animals there, but I'll tell you a little bit more about the animals. But the bottom right there is um, a hot smoker. So the, the hot, the water gets entrained in the subsurface in the center of the earth, and it comes shooting out high volume and also high temperature, so about 300 degrees Celsius. And then as that water hits the cold water of the deep sea, then all the minerals that were entrained in that water um, precipitate out like smoke. So it looks like smoke. And I'll show you a video of that in just a minute. So um, my, as Julie mentioned, my uh, interests are microbial. So I love crazy, weird animals. 
but I also love their interactions with beneficial bacteria. And it turns out that we live on a microbial planet, like it or not, and there are lots of microbes that make this planet uh, livable for us, and also they live on and in us, and same thing with marine invertebrates. So I find it super fascinating to um, study some of these animals and their microbial partners that help them do things that we really didn't think that animals could do. And so uh, a lot of this is, I'll, uh, I'll, as I'll illustrate, it's been um, a little bit of luck. So you go down to the bottom of the ocean, you may or may not find anything. You kind of think you're gonna look in the right place and then you discover something um, completely by accident and that's what's actually kind of fun about it. So, um, so let me just introduce you to the term symbiosis. I'm sure many of you um, are aware of that term and I think, so it's a beneficial, I, I define it as a beneficial interaction between two organisms. And in this case, um, one of these crazy marine invertebrates that you see up here, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of them, and bacteria. And this creates innovation. So biological innovation, it can mean that animals have a really different shape or form, so morph morphology. They can also have really different biochemistry. So some of these animals act more like plants, like they'll take up uh, CO2, so carbon dioxide, rather than uh, releasing it like we do. And so they've changed their biochemistry really dramatically to accommodate a bacterial symbiont that's living maybe in them uh, or on the outside of them. And then finally, uh, really importantly, and you probably get this throughout the lecture, is that it can result in ecological innovation too. So these animals are living where nobody thought animal life could exist, um, and it's because they have a bacterial partner or two or three that they use um, and, you know, to have some kind of uh, superpower. And so they can live in these environments um, that are really uh, quite amazing. So symbiosis to me equals innovation, and it also um, adds to the organismal diversity on life, of, of, on the planet of life, um, which is something that a lot of people are interested in, is what is the actual biodiversity on this planet and how do you measure it? And then niche expansion. So a niche is just sort of where an animal can really make a living successfully. And these, these niches, and a few I'll show you, are really, um, that's been expanded because they have a partnership with um, bacterium. And then finally, evolution, of course. And so entire groups of these animals are symbiotic with some kind of bacteria. And so um, it has a really profound effect on evolution. Okay, so um, some of the animals I'll tell you about today, <clears throat> we've discovered in various places on the, on the Earth and in the ocean, and uh, I brought them all. Uh, they're all in jars up here on the stage if you wanna come up and, and visit any of them. Um, so top left is the Yeti crab, which uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that animal. So E.O. Wilson uh, said that this was one of the coolest top 10 animals discovered in 2007, so that was like really a uh, big deal. Um, there's a clam that I won't be telling you about today that a master student of mine described um, from Costa Rica, the Costa Rica margin. Uh, this crazy looking snail, bottom left, is called the scaly foot snail. You can see why that is, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. And then finally, um, some folks asked me if I'd be talking about whale falls, and uh, I will be talking about the animal that lives on whale, dead whales at the bottom of the ocean, uh, and that is a polychaete worm that we discovered in Monterey Canyon uh, in, the early, in 2002. Okay, so let's start with that yeti crab. So we decided that uh, we, a lot of people, uh, were involved in this. Um, research crews to go all the way over to the Southeast Pacific Rise near Easter Island, where there's a very interesting feature. So there we are in the East Pacific Rise, off of as far as you can get off of Chile and still see um, some kind of island. And it turns out that there's a little plate on the Earth's surface that is spinning around and it's called the Easter microplate. And people that were uh, with me on the cruise were interested in how that creates a barrier to gene flow from the animals above that little spinning plate to um, south of that plate. And so that's why they, they wrote the proposal, they got the cruise to go there. And that's why we we're in that area. But then it, it, you know, if you're gonna go sample the ocean pretty far away from any other known area that's been looked at, you're prepared to find something kind of uh, pretty strange. So, whoa, excuse me, let me, uh, hang on, hang on, I'll unplug. Okay, so this is, uh, this was the scene, this is the creature that none of us had ever, uh, it's very dramatic actually, coming over the hill. Um, this animal uh, was the first of its kind, so we had an expert on board that was, he was French and he was a uh, crab expert and he um, realized that this animal was new to science and that nobody had ever seen anything like it. 
And you can see that it's quite hairy, and it's actually white. These bristles have these filamentous white things hanging off of it. And um, it turns out, so there was only one in the area, and we actually did collect it. But it turns out that other people have seen many others since. And this was a male, and it now it's the holotype for the species, Kiwa hirsuta, and it lives in uh, the Paris Museum. Lives, it's preserved. It is housed in the, in the Paris Museum as a holotype. So there it is, amazing animal. And so we were curious what those, what all that white was. And it was named the Yeti crab because it looked like an abominable snowman. So here it is. So remember that living in a microbial world business. So if you look very closely at the CD of the arms of this crab, <clears throat> you see all kinds of filamentous bacteria. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of the, this is here, is the actual crab, uh, structure on the crab, and then on top of that structure are all kinds of filamentous bacteria. And so we were very interested in that microbial community. Turns out it's a specific microbial community that just lives on the surfaces of crustaceans, on crabs. And um, we had some collaborators that found another group of these animals living off of Costa Rica. And they managed to take some pictures of this animal. And so you can see what it's doing. So we wondered, why does that animal have all that fuzz, fuzzy bacteria on the outside of it? So I don't know if you can see that what it's doing, but it's actually grooming itself and eat, stuffing those things into its mouth. So it's eating the bacteria off of its body. And so essentially it grows, it's like a little farmer. It grows its own garden and then it rakes, it rakes the bacteria and, and eats it. And it has special uh, morphology for doing this. It has something unlike any crab in the world. It has this amazing comb-like structure that it uses to uh, comb those bacteria. So then what do they do? So they have to then grow more. So as a farmer, you have to nourish these microbes, right? And so this animal needs to provide, these are microbes that use inorganic chemicals that are emitted from those underwater volcanoes. So the crabs, they're now called the dancing yetis, they actually, they're wagging their arms over cracks in the seafloor where all this hot sulfitic water is coming up. And so you can see them doing that. So this, this uh, animal was described by another group um, and uh, called them Kiwa Pura Vida for Costa Rica. And um, it was a, a really great paper and they did much more uh, than we ever did when we first discovered the first population. So the dancing yeti, so they're nourishing their microbes and then they're eating them. They also probably provide a detoxification role because hydrogen sulfide is very poisonous and um, they probably use them as this sort of cloak, this defensive mechanism, so they themselves won't be poisoned by the hydrogen sulfide. And so we were interested, this is a, a little baby Yeti crab, so I have one of these, so I have an adult up here, and then I have the baby, which is about two millimeters in, in uh, width. And we were very interested in how that microbial community, the bacterial community, changes over time. So you have this two millimeter newly uh, metamorphosed larval form of the crab, and then you have the adult, which is many centimeters big. And so my research group, all uh, on the shoulders of undergraduates at Oxy, um, have been um, characterizing the microbial community that uh, occurs and lives on these animals through their development. And so uh, this was a, the paper that a few of my students um, generated. And you can see all these beautiful microscopic images on the corners of the image are the microbes that live on uh, even this very young Yeti crab. And we've realized a few things about how the microbial community uh, changes over time. So since that discovery, <clears throat> very recently actually, 2009 was the discovery, but 2012 was the paper, um, it's kind of one of these things where one group finds something interesting and then everybody else starts to discover them and you realize there was this animal on the planet that nobody knew about and uh, now we see them in a lot of different places. So this was a group from Southampton in England who went to the, uh, to the lower Antarctic, so much further south than we went, and they also discovered Yeti crabs and they even named one of the structures the Ivory Tower because it was so covered in yetis, and so um, this was way more than we had ever seen in the south southeast Pacific and in Costa Rica. And so this is an amazing population of these crabs, and they're still doing quite a lot of work on them. So that's very, very exciting that they discovered a third species called now Kiwa tyleri uh, after one of the scientists there. Okay, so that's the yeti crab. 
So um, now another story about going pretty far away. This was the longest I had ever been at sea, which was a six-week cruise to the Indian Ocean. And we were using the Jason, which is this submersible, um, and our ship was the Knorr. And again, those are run by Woods Hole. And uh, the scientists, you can see that there was a lot of collaborating institutions, and the lead scientists were from Woods Hole, and they wanted to go all the way over to the Indian Ocean, where there's a, an interesting feature called the Rodriguez Triple Junction. And so you see that in the little um, picture of the world with the star. And so that was very interesting to these molecular ecologists that wanted to go over there and look at the biogeography um, and see, you see that the Indian Ocean is squarely between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, and nobody had ever looked at these underwater volcanoes in the Indian Ocean, and so there were questions about, would they be more similar? How do they get around these big continents, these animals? And so w would they have an affinity to either of those, um, those environments, those communities? And so we went all the way over there. And again, when you're going so far away from anything that's ever been explored, um, you are bound to find something new. And this was an amazing animal that we discovered. Uh, most everybody that was in the control room at the time realized that this animal was new to science. And just because it has such an unusual morphology, and I'll show you a, a bigger picture of it in just a second. But that was, um, that was uh, on the top left is what those hot smokers look like. And you can see all these shrimp crawling all over. And uh, the red arrows show you where we had discovered these snails that looked a little bit different from the other snails. So they were in and amongst other snails, but they were quite unusual. And we named this the scaly foot snail. We're not that original, I guess, or creative, but um, they're a pretty amazing animal. And the, the guy who's uh, described these animals is a, a snail expert, Anders Warren. And he also realized that the, this animal was very special. And what's amazing about this animal is that there is no animal on Earth that looks like it. And the only thing that even resembles it lived 500 million years ago in the Cambrian Oceans. And it's called Halkiaria. And so that was, um, there's a fossil uh, uh, image of, of this animal. So it's very intriguing. And we'd like to think that this animal might be ancient, but then the molecular biology suggests that this snail is actually a recently evolved uh, lineage. So what's super interesting about them, of course, to me, is that maybe there's microbes involved. So this is the animal and those really crazy scales that no other animal has. And we named this animal Chrysomalum squamiferum, which means to bear scales. And again, if you look on these scales, they have a very unique microbial community that is hanging out on those scales, and it is specific to them. And we think that it's involved in this very strange mineral that they make these scales out of. So there's no animal known on Earth that can make its own tissues or structures out of iron sulfides. And you guys know that as pyrite and, or fool's, fool's gold. And so this animal, actually, those, there's a layer on those scales and on its shell that is made of pyrite. And so we think that the microbes are playing a big role in um, that crazy mineralization. And it turns out that that's a, a really important thing for some people in um, looking at properties of biological materials. And so there's been uh, much more interest from that perspective than, than from um, anybody else. It's been very hard to get back to the Indian Ocean uh, to, to look for them. But what has happened since that discovery, there was a, a group that was using um, uh, research vessels from uh, the uh, Japanese Marine Institute, their gems tech, and they discovered a white form of the scaly snail that does not mineralize its tissues, and that was uh, a pretty exciting find, and they published that. And so they're still studying that and that form. So it's still the same genus, but it does something quite different with its mineralization. So it's a very amazing animal. Also, as I mentioned, people are getting interested in the properties, the physical properties of um, these, uh, this material, and so this is a woman at MIT whose project is funded by the Department of Defense, and she is interested in looking for uh, really strong armor. And you can see, so I, I don't expect you to read it all, but she's looking at um, the different materials in the snail shell and the scales, and what she says is, we report new materials and me mechanical design principles of the iron-plated, multi-layered structure of the armor of chrysomalin. It is unlike any other known natural or synthetic engineered armor, and that it has um, technological interest um, for a variety of civilian and defensive applications. And so I suspect we'll hear more from the armor of the scaly snail. And I found this really hilarious uh, image <laughs> on uh, her website uh, that says, snail's armor eyed by the military. So 
Um, stay tuned for more on the scaly snail. So not from our perspective, but certainly from hers. So that's uh, pretty funny. Okay, so then the last animal I wanted to tell you about uh, was found in Monterey Canyon. And I don't know if you know about Monterey Canyon, it's this amazing place because it's equivalent to the Grand Canyon, but right offshore. So you can get to the deep sea in uh, simply a boat ride. And so there we are. So you see California there, it's Monterey Bay. And the Research Institute is located literally right at the tip of the canyon. And then um, they have numerous um, ships. So this is uh, one of the submersibles that we've used, the Tiburon, and I'll show you. Um, uh, some video footage from another one, the Doc Ricketts. And that's called the Western Flyer, that weird swath-shaped ship. Um, this, this Ambari is funded by um, David Packard, of Hewlett Packard, and he always wanted a ship that looked like that. And so that's what they built. Uh, in, so the, the ROV is actually lowered through the center of the ship, um, through a moon pool. And then the bottom left is a picture of what it's like in the control room. So it's like watching a movie. But after the movie, you get samples. So that's what I, uh, you know, it's a pretty uh, amazing movie. And uh, so uh, let me show you some of the video uh, pictures that we have gotten from these amazing environments in the bottom of the uh, canyon. So this is, um, we stumbled across this completely by accident. So what you see there is a homing beacon that we've placed there and then we've come back to it. And this is a dead gray whale on the bottom of the seafloor. And it turns out that these are really amazing habitats for a lot of animals, because you remember, in the deep sea, there's not a lot of carbon that lands on the seafloor because everybody else is using it as it and you know goes through the water column. Well, if you've got you know 2,000 tons of a whale that lands on the seafloor, it's like a bonanza of organic carbon, and a lot of animals take advantage of that. So this uh, octopus that you see is living in the skull of this gray whale. And that octopus was there every single year that we went for five years. And uh, this octopus, I don't know if it's male or female, we never did determine. At the base of the den, you can see this little mitten of carcasses of crabs and other things. So that animal, so this is at the base of the skull, was uh, happily uh, living there and eating all these other uh, animals. They were taking advantage of this carbon. And you can see the baleen there as well. So this was uh, kind of an amazing site. So when we first came up, this was, again, by accident, we were looking for something else in the seafloor. And a lot of these animals, this is, this is one of those examples where we collected a ton of animals, and, but the experts really just can't get to describing these species. So uh, some of those green-headed worms that you see in the bottom, those have yet to be, uh, to, to be described, but we know that they are a new species of an amphorated polychaete and uh, some of the others. So let me just show you the animal that I've worked on. It was also uh, pretty exciting to discover. So this is um, the, scapula, the scapula of a gray whale. And so we're very interested. You might um, be distracted because there's a lot of biology that likes to hang out at these gray whales, uh, these whale falls. But what we were interested in these little cute little redheads there that um, were sort of waving in the breeze. And these were... Um, also, everybody on board, um, nobody could uh, imagine what this animal was. So this was definitely new to everybody on board. And we have experts that come with us that have seen most every animal in Monterey Canyon. They're part of the video crew. And so that animal was really uh, pretty intriguing. And so here's what it looks like. And this is another example of how you have this niche that nobody really appreciated. Uh, until you start to find uh, several of them. And this is a whale fall as a habitat. So um, they are great alive, these whales, but they're also really um, do fuel amazing communities in the deep sea. So this is what it looks like when you pick up a rib bone and there's all these worms uh, sticking out of this rib bone. Well, I'll say that we actually didn't realize that they were worms. We didn't really know what phylum they were in. And then when you cut a cross section through the rib, you actually see that they are burrowed into the bone. And uh, their fame and fortune was because they were on an episode of Bones. So that's uh, a little bit inaccurate, I have to say. So they're not quite so pink. But you see the skull there and Ossidex sticking out. So um, if you're interested, I can give you the, I think, the episode. So that was a pretty uh, great uh, career moment. Um, so also this animal has, of course, a symbionts. Uh, I probably wouldn't be mentioning them today. So we actually named this animal Ossidex ruby plumis which literally means bone-eating redhead. And uh, so Ossidax and Ruby Plumas. Many people also just call them the bone worms. 
well, they also, they would not be able to do what they do and be successful uh, drilling into bone and getting, using that as nutrients, except for they have bacterial symbionts and they're not on the outside of their body, they're actually on the inside of their body. So they have little pockets inside these amazing roots. So we call these roots because we can't figure out anything else to call them. They look really like plant roots, they're green, and they sort of are like a network. And they have bacterial symbionts in those roots. The other really interesting thing about these animals is that they don't have a mouth or a gut or any way to feed themselves. And so they rely completely on um, these bacterial symbionts. So they're really a, a fascinating uh, worm. Also very unlike any animal on Earth, which is why we had such a hard time figuring out what phylum they belong to. And so we ended up sending them to experts who, who eventually told us that they were, in fact, polychaete worms. And so this is an, an example of how there's this amazing morphological innovation by an animal evolutionarily to accommodate a bacterium that's gonna live inside of a special tissue. And so no animal on Earth has an equivalent tissue to this green root tissue. And you can see that it's a very thin layer of tissue and it surrounds this is the female. So it surrounds the, her ova, ova sac and ovaries. And then you can see in the bottom right there that it, there's a big blood vessels going to feed uh, this tissue nutrients. And, um, and vice versa, probably picking up nutrients from the symbionts and then delivering them back to the, the animal. So there's a nutritional interaction between the animal and these bacteria that live in these roots. And so again, this is, a, this is an electron micrograph, this time transmission. So we've sent the electrons through the tissue and we can get a sense of um, the ultrastructure of that tissue and you can see bacteria. And so that round structure is actually one of the worm cells and inside that cell is a whole bunch of bacteria. And then on the bottom one, you just see a little uh, solitary bacteria inside of a vacuole, which is then again inside of this special cell. So that's really an intimate uh, situation for this worm. They have allowed bacteria to live inside of their cells um, and in exchange, they get nutrients from them. Since that discovery, uh, there's been all kinds of Ocidac sightings. So you just have to either sink a whale or find a dead whale and you will find an Ocidac species. It's literally that easy. And uh, so 17 new Ocidac species have been described and discovered, um, some of them as far away as the Arctic and, so, uh, and Japan and off of Sweden, and then many more in Monterey Canyon. And so really uh, pretty amazing animals, very prolific. Uh, they are, you just, we've had to redeploy um, whales that have washed up on shore and you sink them to the seafloor, and within a month, you get Ocidac showing up. So their larvae are hanging around in the water waiting for the appropriate environment. And so here's a, here's a schematic that an artist uh, did for us. So you have the whale skeleton at the top, and at the bottom left here, you have um, a female. And she has eggs that she spawns into the environment, and they develop, and they get fertilized and they develop into a larvae. The larvae you can see, it's going all the way over to the right there and it lands on the sea floor. And this is the most amazing thing, one of the most amazing things about this animal is that it has something called environmental sex determination. So the larvae can either become male or female. And if the larvae lands on a bone, it becomes female. And if it lands on a female, it becomes a male. And there's only one other animal on earth that does that. It's a spoonworm, an echiurin. And so this really attracted a lot of attention, not from my group, because I study the micros, but from a lot of people who study <clears throat> very strange invertebrates. And so um, this is what a female looks like, and that's what the male looks like. And the male is not that big. So the male is only a few hundred microns in size. So they're dwarf parasitic males. And this is what they look like. So that's a female on the right, and that's her trunk in horizontal. And you can see all the, the arrows are the males. And so the males uh, stay that small. So this is another case of really dramatic sexual dimorphism. So she's huge and he's little and they all compete. All the males um, are hanging around her oviduct. So they're competing to fertilize the egg as she's moving them through the oviduct. And so they are really uh, completely fascinating and they, they hang on in a not so nice way. So those are the hooks of the male. So they stay anchored onto her uh, body wall. Um, so it's just the most bizarre things that happen in the deep sea and you can imagine maybe this is uh, a good strategy. So if you uh, haven't that much of a chance of finding your mate, maybe you should hang on for dear life until the time comes. 
And you can see that actually in the anglerfish, they have an amazing anglerfish in the exhibit that shows the male hanging on and getting absorbed by the female. So that's another amazing example of sexual dimorphism in the animal kingdom. It's amazing. Okay, uh, okay. and then I just wanted to show you uh, last thing here. Uh, what happens to one of those whales over time? So we've been revisiting this uh, carcass that we accidentally discovered in 2002. And it's around, I, I didn't actually mention, it's almost in 3,000 meters depth of water. And so what's really cool about that is that it's too deep for things that would scavenge all the material away, like sleeper sharks and hagfish. So it's too deep for them. And so instead, who gets a chance to take over is these very um, sort of opportunistic invertebrates and then the microbes. And so it's going, um, you might think this is rather quick, but this is actually a much uh, less rapid um, decomposition than what you see in much shallower depth. So it was really a fun um, uh, experiment, Mother Nature's experiment, really. And so you can see the initial discovery at the top panel, 34 months later, 45 months, 70 months, and 85 months later. So we've actually been visiting these um, sites for about 12 years now. And as long as there's a little bit of bone, you can see the little bone fragments, they'll still be ocidax. But of course, they get um, further and further um, depress their populations. So we actually sink other bones to encourage uh, the larvae to settle out uh, off-site, and we sample those as well. So anyway, I'll just leave you with this, and then I'm happy to answer questions. So I, I would remind you that the majority of the seafloor remains unexplored by humans, and that in just uh, the short careers of just a few people, um, we've discovered new animals that are so unusual compared to other life on the planet that there are sure to be uh, so many more. So I have many, many more collaborators than this. This is actually uh, that it's not always so nice to be in a submersible. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have lots of collaborators. These are four main collaborators that contributed to what you saw today, and without them, it would, none of that would have been possible. Um, but there's so many more people to thank. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions.